Please, Dan North. Thanks. Thank you. Super. So let me start by saying hello. There we go, let's get that out of the way. So, um, yes, I, I'm going to try to be the rug that ties all this together. So we've had some beautiful talks about beauty of code and elegance of code and musicality and harmony. And then, uh, uh, Nyar is wonderful, yeah, but let's just get some work done, shall we? <laughs> kind of focusing on business value. So I'm going to try and bring those together a little bit. Um, so... Uh, I'm Dan. I've been in technology for about 30-odd years now, which is slightly terrifying. And more than 15 of those, probably getting on for 20 of those in what we would now call the Agile space. So before it was called Agile. In like late 90s, I was involved in, in, in some of these like extreme programming and things. I didn't write. I wasn't a contributor to the Agile manifesto. Uh, I was one of the very early consumers of it. So that's my kind of background, if you like. On the way through, um, I accidentally invented my own software method called behavior-driven development. It was never supposed to be a thing, but then it became a thing, and now it has its own conference, which is a bit weird. Uh, um, so don't go inventing things, because then people stare at you. Uh, <coughs> but one of the things that happened, one of the reasons I started talking about behavior-driven rather than test-driven development was, um, was the idea that it wasn't really about testing. <coughs> I was trying to get this just shift on to kind of thinking about software behavior and value, funny enough, and, uh, and still people got confused. And so BDD, I kind of coined the term BDD, and well, I started talking about it in 2003. I wrote an article about it in 2006. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and it was kind of, I thought it was fairly self-explanatory. But then what's happened is people have got really confused about how that ties in with testing as well. So that's what this talks about. <clears throat> but before I start, I have a gift for Kevlin. Where's Kevlin? Is he still here? There he is, fantastic. Okay, if you go out of this door here and walk just directly across the corridor, you'll see this. <laughs> here, I found you a Kevlin. It just seemed perfect. So anyway, that's enough of that. Motivation, why am I talking about BDD and testing? So, um, there's a number of things, and I, I hang out with a lot of testers, I hang out with a lot of developers, um, and I'm, I'm very spoilt in my life, I'm very uh, lucky and privileged in my life that I get to hang out at a lot of conferences and meet loads of really interesting people. And one of the things I hear a lot is that testers feel like they're being left behind by Agile. Okay, so this Agile stuff comes along, this transformation rolls into town, and there's, you know, the, the project managers can go off on a two-day residential class and come back as scrum masters. I know you're not supposed to, but they do. And then all the business analysts go off on a different two-day class and come back as product owners, and everyone's certified, and it's brilliant. And the developers go off and do clean code and TDD and boot camps and all that, and the testers are going, Just a, what about us? And they're going, shut up, shut up, you testers. Right? Um, and then I'll go into, and I've had a number of clients, in fact, Tibby, one of my buddies, is here now. We worked on a, on a, on a, uh, uh, at a client together in the UK, and this was the first time I ever came across the term BDD as a plural noun. So we have hundreds of BDDs. Like, what's a BDD? So what they mean is like these automated scenario things. They called them the BDDs. And they had hundreds, in fact, thousands of BDDs, and all the BDDs were rotting in a pile in the corner, which was a bit unfortunate. Um, and then I see people hiring for automation testers. I don't actually know what an automation tester is. I can, well, literally, it's someone who tests whether there is automation. <laughs> Have you automated that? Yes, check. There we go. <laughs> right. but other than that, I don't understand what this role is. Um, generally, like, I'm going to say poor training around uh, Agile testing. I'm going to rant about this at length, so I'll, 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 I'll move on. Um, and one of the things I see again quite a lot is this idea of, of this, um, actually Microsoft invented this, they call it an SDET, Software Development in Test. Or uh, Google called them SET, Software Engineers in Testing. And the idea is that you take someone with a programming background and put them in a testing role. And these people are evil. These people are evil. In fact, uh, Microsoft didn't invent this. There's, there's wonderful stories about uh, a group um, from HP, back when HP were like, cool. No, um, 
in, in like the 70s. Uh, they were called the Black Team at, at HP, and you did not want your software tested by the Black Team. It would come back in tatters, right? They were evil, right? And say, oh, I've got this. We're going to put this uh, new firmware in a, in a printer. That's great. We'll just give it to the Black Team. No, you won't. I'm not ready yet. Give me another six months of uh, trying to fix it up first. And so these people had, had, um, had cachet and all this. And, and, and so now testers, the people, when I talk to testers, they're really nervous about almost like software developers coming over here and stealing our jobs kind of thing. So, okay, uh, I know John Skeet has to leave halfway through, so I'm going to summarize the whole thing, and then he can get off and catch his plane. It's very important. Okay, so here's what I'm going to say. Programmers don't understand testing. This is my first assertion. My second assertion, possibly a little bit more controversial, Agile doesn't understand testing. Okay. Um, third thing I want to say is testers like BDD. I just find wherever I go, testers like BDD. It's appealing to them. Uh, but the point I want to try and make this afternoon is that BDD isn't about testing. Okay. Now, in order to have a constructive conversation about why BDD isn't about testing, we need to talk about testing. Okay. So why do we have testing? Why does testing, why is testing a thing? Why do we have testing? Or to give it its full name, why do we have bloody testing? Right? Oh. Because developers are human, says Esther. That's, that, that's a surprisingly astute observation. So, yes. And I ask people, why do we have testing? And, and, and I get all kinds of reasons. But the, the most popular reason I get is because we have to. Right? There's some SDLC, some process document somewhere that says, and there will be testing. And you go, oh, OK, there's going to be testing. Right? And, and so you've got these programmers, and they see testing as an irritation. It's a thing that has to get done, and they have to do it, and it's really annoying. Um, and then you talk to project managers, and they see testing as a source of risk, which is remarkably back to front logic. I call it four-legged cow logic. All cows have four legs, therefore all four-legged animals are cows. That's bad logic. That contains a logical fallacy. Uh, um, testing, uh, project managers see testing as a source of risk, right? <laughs> so it's a lot like saying we've, we, we didn't like hearing bad news, so we've banned messengers. We found we got a lot less. Uh, W.C. Field said, when I read how much damage drinking was doing, I gave up reading, <laughs> right? You've got to be very careful with that reading stuff. That'll, that'll get you every time. Um, and so what happens? So testing is the thing that gets squeezed. Okay? So testing gets squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and sometimes drops off the end. And so we think of it as non-differentiating and non-critical. Okay? So in order to explain what I mean by non-differentiating and non-critical, I want to share a model with you. It's a quadrant because I'm a consultant, and so that's what we do. Um, it's not my model. It's a chap called Neil Nicolaisen. Uh, um, and it's in Pollyanna Pixton's book, and I'm not making these names up. I mean, they do sound like they're from a fairy story. Uh, um, and then, then anyway, uh, so Pollyanna Pixton has this wonderful uh, book, uh, and it contains this lovely model by Neil Nicolaisen. Uh, um, and, and when I tell you that there's also someone called Mary Poppendick, you're just going to stop believing me, aren't you? But honestly, these people are real. So purpose alignment model, and he says, so what you have is two axes. You've got like a uh, um, how much is a product market differentiating, and how much is something business critical? Okay, and so then what we have is these four quadrants. So if we look bottom left, which is always the rubbish one, um, he calls this the who cares quadrant. Okay, who cares? It's non-differentiating. It's not very complicated. It's not very critical. Just make it go away. So script it, hack it, do it in Excel. Just get rid of it. Okay, this is this is all, this is taking up noise. So. Then we look at the next quadrant, bottom right, which is this is stuff that's critical but non-differentiating. So this is your payroll system, your email system, your all those kind of things where no one's going to go, oh, I really want to work at Webstep because they've got the best email system. Right? That's not, I, I, I doubt, I doubt that's a reason. Okay? So, so you don't need to have the best email, you don't need to have the best payroll system, but boy are people going to notice if you stop paying them. Yeah, <laughs> they can get a bit twitchy, I found, right? And so we need it to work. And so at that stage, we need parity. All we need is it's the same as everyone else's. So this is a really good piece to outsource. Okay, so you know, don't write your own mail server. Use Gmail or, or some other thing, right? Uh, Exchange. Don't don't build those things yourselves. 
And then we start looking at differentiating, market differentiating work, and we say, well, if it's market differentiating, but it's not critical, so these are our new ideas, our things that we're trying out, maybe stepping into for the first time, we're starting to move some of our estate into the cloud, we're going to hopefully start with the less critical stuff first, because otherwise we're being a bit daft, while we get the hang of it, well, that's when we partner. So that's when we want to find someone else who's already good at this, and have them help us. And so then finally, top right, we have what's called um, Invest in Excel. So this is where we want to be applying most of our effort. So if we assume that all our programmers, all our engineers, everyone involved in development, all our product people are a scarce resource. We don't have infinity of them and they're quite expensive. I hope you're quite expensive. Okay? So if you're not, we should talk. Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so, so th these are my scarce resource. What happens is mostly we get stuck in this bottom Look at this, James Bond. Doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. We get stuck in this bottom corner here. Okay. How does that work? Oh, hang on. Go back. Try that again. Boom. Boom. Okay. We get stuck in this bottom, le bottom left corner. So this is a dynamic diagram. What I mean by that is this. I want that middle line moving that way, and I want this line moving that way. I want to be doing less and less non-business critical stuff. I want to be doing less and less non-differentiating work. That should be a deliberate operational strategy for how I do work. So this Neil Nicolaisen model, it's, it's a, I love this because it's a great build versus buy um, tool. You know, I've seen organizations where they pendulum. It's usually about on a three yearly basis. We're going to buy everything. We're going to outsource everything and see where that gets them. And then three years later, a new CIO comes in. What an idiot the last CIO was. We're going to build everything. And then that lasts for about three years. They move on. The new CIO comes in and says, well, at my last place, we bought everything and, and so on. Where it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Okay. The stuff that is your secret sauce, you should be building that. So what have we done with testing? We said, well, testing goes there. Testing is non-differentiating. Um, it's just this bloody annoying thing that we bloody have to do, bloody testing. Okay? So, so I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, well, maybe that's because we don't understand what it's there for. Okay? You know, we care so much about testing, we send it offshore. You know, we've got some people in India to do it. And they're smarter than us, so they've got some people in Southeast Asia to do it. And they've shipped it off to... <laughs> and by the time you find out who's actually doing your testing, there's like three levels of interaction and no one cares. So we think of it as high volume, low cost, low skill, commodity type work. So what do we think is the goal of testing then? What's the point of testing? And I have a class that I teach called Testing Faster, and in that class I say, what's the point of testing? And I have 25 people in my class and I get about 30 different answers. Right? So here's some of the types of answers I get. Uh, well, let, let, me, let me throw it out there. What, what's the point of testing? Wow, loads of people. Loads of Swedes spoke at once. That never happens. <laughs> OK, say again. Finding bugs, minimize risk. Confidence. OK. To, to what, sorry? Ah, to, yeah, yeah, and also to feed my confirmation bias, yeah. So, 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 yeah, to find information. That's the thing I hear. Testing is about finding information. No, there's a word for finding information. It's called research, okay? Research is when you go and find information, okay? Testing does involve finding information, but in order to what? You're only getting me, giving me half the story. And I sometimes hear this. Well, the goal of testing is to communicate. No, there's a word for that. It's communicate. <laughs> you, you talk to people to communicate. Yes, you communicate by testing. That's true. In order to what? And then you get this one of my favorites. Uh, to enable us to reasonably believe that the probability is low that the product still has important undiscovered problems. You've got to love the context-driven testing, gang. They're nothing if not verbose. Okay? They're also quite angry, but we'll get to that later. Um, <clears throat> they also don't know the difference between testing and checking, and we'll talk about that in a bit too. So anyway, I'm trying to kind of unpack what this testing thing is about. And I came across, and I, I'm going to do something really dangerous here. I'm going to talk about Stack Overflow while John Skeet is in the room. Um, just to be aware, for those of you who don't know, because John Skeet is in the room, Stack Overflow is currently off. <laughs> okay, they've just switched it off because he, he left. Okay, he's, and then when he goes back, he switches, it plugs back in like in the Matrix. Oh, great, the skeet's back, fantastic, we can ask questions. So, 
there's this wonderful question uh, a couple of a few years ago. How deep are your unit tests? And someone's saying, you know, I'm doing this TDD thing, and should, should my tests be like just one or two tests here or there? Should I be super comprehensive? Uh, should I test every getter and every method and every result and all the errors and blah? How deep should they go? And, and no, no, none less than Kent Beck <laughs> replied on this. On this. It's still there. They've, they're one of those ones that they've frozen, you know, archived for interest type thing. Uh, so the link's there. Uh, um, and so Kent replies, and what, what, what do you think Kent said? He, he, no, he didn't say this. He said, I get paid for code that works, not for tests. I do the smallest amount of work, the smallest amount of testing as I possibly can. And oh my word, some people went into meltdown, right? <laughs> the comments under St. Kent's response, right, are things like, but you can't say that about TDD. And, and people are clearly having like existential crises <laughs> because the master tries to write as few tests as possible. And... Uh, <laughs> And it's interesting because he says to reach a given level of confidence, okay, and that there's a what that one word really resonated with me. Given level of confidence for whom, right? For whom? And this ties back to what Linda was saying this morning about our cognitive biases. Um, so here's my punt. Here's my pitch. I've been iterating on this for a while. Um, I would argue this. I believe the goal of testing is to increase confidence for stakeholders through evidence. Don't worry, I'm going to unpack that statement. The goal of testing is to increase confidence for stakeholders through evidence. Stakeholders. Stakeholders are, 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 are people, right? Stakeholders are, so if I'm building a software product, who are my stakeholders? Users, my users are stakeholders, yep. Who else? The programmers themselves are, 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 are stakeholders. Future you is a stakeholder in any work that current you is doing, especially if future you will pick up the same code base. Okay? Because future, I'll tell you what, present me is pretty furious about some of the dumb things that six months ago me did. Six months ago, I was a rubbish programmer. I'm amazing now, but six months ago, I was rubbish. Um, yeah, so other developers are stakeholders. Who else? Product owner, security, compliance, legal, testers, analysts, support people, lots and lots and lots of people. Uh, one of my favorite UX folks, a chap called Mark McNeil, has this lovely phrase for stakeholders. He says, people whose lives you touch. Okay? Stakeholders are people whose lives you touch by doing work. Okay, so if you're working on a medical software that is going to improve the quality of all kinds of different people's lives, there's huge amounts of stakeholders involved in there, people whose lives you touch. So that's what I mean by stakeholders. Increasing confidence is a very deliberate phrase. It's subjective. It's not my confidence, it's their confidence. Okay, and increasing, well, you know, increasing by how much? Yeah, what does it take to increase? And... <clears throat> What do they need confidence in? So if I'm a security person, what gives me confidence? If I'm a compliance person, what gives me confidence? If I'm another developer looking at your code, what gives me confidence? Okay. Um, and there's loads of ways I could give you confidence. I could say, trust me. Trust me, I wrote it, it's awesome. Honestly, it's fine, ship it. Right? <laughs> it might work. <laughs> Depends on my reputation. If I've answered more than a million questions on Stack Overflow, people might believe me, I don't know. Um, so, but actually, no, through evidence. Right? I don't want any of the other kind of confidence, I want evidence. Okay? How will you demonstrate this? And so, given that statement, and all the other things that we think testing is about, I think are directly or indirectly derived from this statement, um, I can then make this assertion, I think a good tester has three superpowers. Right? Uh, these, these are necessary and sufficient superpowers. The first thing they need is they need to be able to get inside someone else's head. You cannot think about what would make someone confident unless you can think as them, unless you can walk in their shoes, okay? So that's the first thing I need is empathy. I need to understand what it's like to be that person. Um, second thing I need is I need to get that evidence. 
I might get that evidence by squirreling around in a database. I might get that evidence by wire sharking a network. I might get that evidence by having uh, eye tracking cameras on the corners of a screen and just see how you. I, 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 there's all kinds of devious ways I'm going to get evidence. Okay, so they need to be really ingenious. And, and the third thing they need is they need to be pragmatic. I don't have infinity time, I don't have infinity resources, I don't have infinity money, um, which means we have to get to a sufficient level of confidence sufficiently across our portfolio, our universe of stakeholders in order to feel safe to ship this, in order to feel safe to put this out there. Okay. So, so that's what I think testing is about. So that's, that's the base. We've all got a level playing field now. If you don't think this is what testing is about, come and have a go at me afterwards. We'll be in the pub. We can duke it out there. I'm pretty confident that this is what I think testing is about. So now I can start to unpack what I wanted to say. The first thing is this. Programmers don't understand testing. Right? My, my, <laughs> my ever-increasing data points for this is no one in my classes ever gives me that as an answer. They never understand that it's about other people. They never understand that it's about confidence. They never understand that it's about evidence until you lay it out and it's hiding in plain sight and they go, oh, yeah, well, that seems like a pretty sensible thing to do. So <clears throat> I wrote an article a while ago uh, called Test Driven Development is Not About Testing. So I don't, I'm basically a stuck record. Right? I just say the same thing again and again with just slightly different words. I want to draw your attention to a number of things. The first thing is this. I wrote this in 2003. Okay, that's like, this, is, this article is a teenager, right? This article can drive in some countries, yeah? Uh, second thing is a number of people read it, which was nice. I don't know when they froze that number, but, you know, a lot of people read it, which is great. The third thing is I've always been this good looking, okay? Um, <clears throat> but the main thing I want to draw your attention to is the title. Test driven development is not about testing. And so the first comments I got, I was, being, I was being trolled before we used the word troll. So the first comments I got with this article were, you don't understand, why are you writing about testing? You're still, you're, you're, programmers shouldn't be writing tests. Oh, for crying out loud, you haven't got as far as the title, have you? Right? <laughs> they didn't even take in all the words in the title. But so I was trying to explain that test driven development wasn't about testing, testing is a different thing. So. <clears throat> I was trying to move testing. I was trying to say testing isn't in this bottom left corner. It's more than that. It's like a control function. Okay, so testing, you can think of testing like governing constraints. So maybe it's critical but non-differentiating. Okay? Maybe it's over there. Right? So maybe you know, like compliance or something like that. Maybe it's a thing we, we need it not to tick a box. We need it because it keeps us safe. It makes it okay to do things. And so that was kind of my position for a while. And then, okay, <clears throat> my next statement then. Agile doesn't understand testing. So why would I say that? Well, the Agile Manifesto was written by programmers, okay? All of Agile stuff was largely invented by programmers. These 17 middle-aged white guys who met in Snowbird in 2001 um, were all programmers, apart from, with the one exception, possible exception of Brian Marrick, who describes himself as a micro-scale, retro-futurist, anarcho-syndicalist programmer, right? um, who does quite a lot of testing too. But basically, they're all programmers. Now, <clears throat> that doesn't mean they didn't care about testing. That means they didn't think about testing in the way that testers think about testing. So it's implied, right? So testing is implied. It's never explicit. Okay. In the same way, for instance, when who's, who read the first Extreme Programming Explained book? The white book, the XP, the original XP book. Okay, brilliant. There's Kent Beck talks about four values. He says there's four things that I care about when I write software. I care about simplicity, I care about communication, I care about feedback, and I care about courage. Okay? Those are the things I care about. And it's kind of really interesting that one of those is this really human characteristic of courage. Right, simplicity, communication, feedback, I get all of that. That's all software, design stuff. Courage, wow, that's pretty deep. Uh, um, and then the rest of the book's an experience report from this project he did with Chrysler, and then everyone took that as a religion. And they said, well, if you're not doing the 12 holy practices of XP, we have to excommunicate you. Uh, it was all very silly. So then he wrote a second book. And in the second book, he said there are five. There are not four, but five uh, uh, values. So there's simplicity, feedback, courage, uh, um, communication, and respect. He had to add respect 
The reason he didn't have respect in the first book wasn't because he doesn't respect people. It's the opposite. It's so intrinsic, you shouldn't have to say it. You know, so the values of XP are simplicity, feedback, courage, communication, and don't kick puppies. <laughs> right? Oh, I'm glad you put that there. I was just about to go puppy kicking. And then there it was, written in black and white. Okay? And, and so testing's implied. Yeah? Uh, and so in all of the Agile methods that were represented in that room, there were probably about a dozen different Agile methods. You know, Scrum and XP are the ones we know, but there's also uh, DSDM, there's Adaptive, there's Feature Driven, there's a whole bunch of other different methods that were in the, um, in the room at the same time um, from all different areas. Crystal, uh, Alistair Coburn's brilliant family of methods that no one understands because they're so simple. Uh, um, so they were all being represented there, but there was no explicit testing role. Okay, no explicit role for testing. It was like, you know, you kind of probably should sort her. So, <clears throat> so that's where I got to with this, yeah? And in the years since, in the decade or 15 years or so since, we have some explicit testing things. So you have folks like uh, George Dinwiddie, Janet Gregory, Lisa Crispin, talking about this three amigos type idea where you, where you explicitly involve testers. But they are a tiny, tiny voice in a very big space. So <clears throat> anyway, part of the reason I got onto this rant was this. Um, two of my clients, uh, about three, four years ago now, within the same week, weirdly, complete coincidence, said, Dan, we're doing this agile transformation journey thing, blah. Um, and our testers are a bit lost. Can you recommend training for Agile, for testers moving into this Agile ways of working? We've got stuff for uh, the, the, the project managers and the analysts and the blah and the blah, but we don't really have anything for testers. I was like, sure, let me just go and have a look. I'm sure there's some t good training out there for testers. So, so I went off to have a look. Uh, and this was one of the syllabuses I found. It says uh, it's going to be three days, uh, course so four days in the classroom, where well, the split is around 50% theory, yada, yada, yada. And I looked at this and day one and day two, and I'm like reading day two, and I've got onto day three, and I'm like, oh, hey, I found some testing stuff. <laughs> hey, that is all of the testing content. Okay? The rest of it is fluff to fill up a four day class, because otherwise you're selling a three hour class, and that doesn't really sell. <laughs> so if I can guff it out with some other stuff, I can sell a four day class. That, that, that's, that's the only way, the only, only reason I can think of. And of course, in there is test room development. Right. Which isn't about testing. I refer you to my earlier article. Okay. If anyone's not sure, it's in there. Um, so uh, here's another one. Another class. What you'll learn. Bunch of bullets. Um, hey, there's some testing stuff in there. That's pretty good. I mean, not that much, but there's some. Um, and TDD. Because you have to have TDD in a testing class. Because no, stop. Okay. My, my favorite one. My favorite one is Certified Agile Tester. So this one, you get a certificate. This one, you get a certificate, and look at all these grown-up companies that are endorsing it, which is nice, right? So I look at it, and day one is just filler. Day one is just noise, okay? So, pfft. Day two. Day two is called planning, right? We're not even going to pretend this is about testing, right? And there's a little bit of testing there. There you go. Literally nothing else on there is about testing. Nothing. Okay. And then we have day three. And again, we have, oh, look, towards the end of the afternoon, we're going to look at testing. Um, and then day four, uh, in the morning, a little bit of testing, and then just I don't know, stuff. Agile for large projects. What can we shove in there? You got any one hour modules? Yeah, I've got an Agile for large projects module. I'll shove that on the end. They won't know. Call it testing. Right? And I was just like, oh, test-driven developments there as well. I was just like, what? <laughs> right? Is this the state of the art of agile testing training? Um, <clears throat> so a very brief plug. I'm not here to plug this thing. I'm just here to, to, uh, as an illustration. I then actually had to put a class together. Um, I ended up putting a class together for both these clients. We put a load of people through it, and I got really good feedback. And my class has stuff in it that I want to get from a testing class. It looks at test strategy and test design, and there's BDD in there because people expect a bit of that, but it's about like, how is BDD different from testing and how does it relate. And then there's some stuff about designing for testability, flipping the whole thing on its head. I'm not putting that up there to tell you about my class. I'm putting that up there because I am still astonished. This is about a four or five year old class now. I'm still astonished that this isn't a thing. There aren't lots of other training companies out there selling agile testing training with this in it. 
right? <laughs> I still can't, maybe I'm not looking in the right places, I still can't find test training for Agile testers. Agile does not understand testing. Okay. So here's the thing then, BDD, <coughs> it turns out, is appealing to testers. They quite like it. And I was thinking about why that is. And well, so behavior driven development started in, as I say, 2003, started as a way for me to coach developers in TDD. And <coughs> as I say, I, I didn't design it as a method or a thing. It was just, it was a coaching tool. So the idea was I was working at ThoughtWorks at the time, a uh, lovely software consulting firm. And they were very much agile pioneers. You know, Martin Fowler, one of the agile manifesto authors and signatories and blah, is their chief scientist. And you know, they they've really have uh, trailblazed a lot of agile methods, um, particularly agile into bigger organizations. That's, that's their thing. And I was in a big company. And what would happen is time after time, we're back to my you know, 2003 article, is time after time, uh, developers were saying, oh, okay, so uh, right, we're going to start by writing a test. We're, we're programmers. So, so what? So we don't write tests. We have testers for that. Right? They're down the hall. We paid them less. Right? <laughs> Look, okay, this isn't really that kind of test. It's more of a test that's going to guide your, yeah, but is it a unit test or an integration test or a functional test or an acceptance test? Or that? It's just some code, right? Some, uh, just as, and you get into these rat hole conversations. And at the same time as I'm doing this, the testers are kind of tapping me on the shoulder going, Dan, yeah, I hear you're doing this test-driven thing. Yeah. Do you think it's wise for programmers to be writing tests? Like, they don't really understand testing. I'm like, they're not writing tests! Oh, for God. And so I just tried to ignore all the word, could I describe TDD without using the word test? So BDD was my attempt to describe exactly what Kent and Ward are doing with TDD without using the word test. So I started using the word example and specification and behavior and those kind of things. And nothing else was different. I was typing the same things, right? <laughs> nothing else was different and they got it. And so it wasn't like some Zen thing where you had to go through this learning arc of understanding you know, the, the, a test is just a test. A test is more than a test. Oh, a test is just a test in a, in a very Bruce Lee kind of way. Um, no, it was just completely irrelevant. It was noise. So, so I started talking about that. And then over time, it kind of it broadened out to encompass things like analysis. So I was working with a chap called Chris Matz at ThoughtWorks. And he said, wait, the stuff you're doing with programmers with examples and scenarios sounds a lot like analysis, right? So we kind of broadened it out a bit. And so what I find now, though, so for me, it's always been a way of writing software. It's been a method for getting people in a team to collaborate, to build software for people that's going to be useful. OK? Um, back to Niara's point earlier, like if we're not building anything that's useful, it doesn't matter how well we're building it. So it's appealing to testers because why? Well, the first thing is it explicitly acknowledges multiple stakeholders. There's a bunch of different people. In XP has a customer. Um, Scrum has the product owner. And a lot of these early agile methods have, you know, there's a single omniscient entity who can tell you everything about the product. I don't, well, I've never worked in a company like that. I've never worked on a project like that. I've always worked on a project where there are at least 15 screaming stakeholders all want different things now that are different priorities and often completely contradictory, right? That's my customer. <laughs> That's what my customer looks like. And I also don't have a, pro a team full of incredible, you know, the, the, the C3 team at Chrysler were a dozen of the best programmers in the world, right? Because they were Kent's mates. <laughs> and he knows he's quite well connected, right? So I don't have those teams. I have teams with some developers. Some are great and some are less great. And not, you know, not, not, they're not very smart, just they're not very experienced, for instance. Or they might be a different mix of skills. And I've got testers and analysts and different people. So my world has loads of different stakeholders in. So that's what I was trying to represent. We discuss acceptance criteria explicitly from the outset. We start by, um, <coughs> as, as uh, the was it seven habits of highly effective people, uh, start or begin with the end in mind. Okay, so which is ironically number two on the list. <laughs> number two is begin with the end in mind. What is number one then? So wait, how did I get to, anyway? Uh, um <coughs> not my list. So. Uh, um <coughs> Yeah, so, so we, we, we start with the end in mind. We start by talking about what the acceptance criteria are. We start by saying, how will we know when we've met this need? 
I've recently come across all the jobs to be done theory, like the Clay Christensen and that kind of stuff, and it's blowing my mind. I'm really excited by it. Start with the end in mind, and guess what? Everything happens from the perspective of the stakeholders. Right? We're describing application behavior from the perspective of stakeholders, and all these testers are going, hey, that's, that's what we do, that's us, that's our, that's our gig. And in fact, it turns out we increase confidence for stakeholders through evidence. That's what BDD is about, and so testers go, well, hey, I, I recognize that. I wouldn't have used those words, but I recognize that. Which is kind of cool. <clears throat> so therefore, then, it's not surprising okay, that BDD is, is, is usually starts with, you know, I'll go into an organization, and it's the testers, the test managers, the testing teams that have started with BDD. And so now back to our purpose alignment model. And so what BDD is saying is testing isn't just a, uh, a governing constraint. It's a differentiator. It's an enabling constraint. If we do this thing, it enables us to do things that we couldn't otherwise do. Okay? Maybe testability should be a first-class consideration. Maybe rather than thinking of testing as a set of activities that happen downstream, testability is a characteristic of architecture, of design, of deployment, of systems that would mean that we have better quality software. So, so that's, what B, that's how BDD and this wasn't deliberate. Again, it just kind of ended up repositioning testing. It says testing is a differentiating activity. Testability is a differentiating characteristic of software. S software that is testable is, uh, is in an evidence-based way better than software that is not testable. Okay? I can become confident about testable software in a way that I can't become confident about not testable software for many values of I. Right, so that's kind of cool. But then the last assertion then is this, is BDD, even though I've said all that, isn't about testing. So BDD has these, these scenario things, and, <coughs> and, and the scenario is like it's an automated little kind of mini script in a slightly constrained language called Gherkin. Um, and it says, given some context, given some setup, when some event happens, when some system interaction occurs, then uh, these things should be true. Right? That then I should be able to evaluate the system in this way. And it's a really simple, and it, it's, it's, uh, this goes back to the 70s. Um, Kevlin showed me some excellent Tony Hoare calculus that has this same model in it. There's a range assert act, a range act assert rather. So there's many names for the same thing. Uh, we call it given when then. Okay? So, Here's a life cycle of a scenario then. So a scenario, <coughs> these scenarios, I write the scenario before I write any code. I say, okay, well, uh, um, so I, I'm writing my, my scenario for, for uh, my, my ATM. I'm going to get some money out of an ATM. Okay? Uh, I'm not going to log in. Okay? I've, that's, that's not valuable, right? Getting money out of an ATM is valuable. Yeah? Thumb up from the back. Okay? Um, so I'm going to say, right, so given, given I've got an ATM, you know, it's like the obvious stuff. I've got a working ATM, um, I've got a valid card, right, my, my account's in credit, okay? So it's, it's the happy path, right? When I put my card in and you know, request money, and the request money thing might require authentication. Request money might involve me punching in a, a PIN number, but that's not part of the, the value stream, if you like, of that. That's just a, a, an incidental thing. It may also be that I can get, so some ATMs in the UK now, you can just do with contactless. If I'm taking out a small amount, I can take 30 pounds out of an ATM contactless. That user journey doesn't have login. <laughs> it's, it's fine, my, my card's okay. Okay, so when I you know, request some money, then some things happen. Then I get some cash, check, um, not check, check, check. Uh, I, get some, I get some cash, I get my card returned, and my account is debited. We always forget that one. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just getting free money out of a hole in the wall. <laughs> we probably shouldn't have that. Okay, and so that's a typical scenario about an ATM. And then we can think of other scenarios like where the card is damaged or where the account's overdrawn or where the, the, the card's been reported as stolen or whether, and so on. And then we can start thinking of weird edge cases like what if the ATM fails halfway through, right? <laughs> what feedback do I get? I don't know, loads of things. So it starts as an enabling constraint. It says, if you have this, you are likely to come up with better design than if you don't think about this ahead of time. Okay. Then it checks the solution. <clears throat> I will come back to this word check shortly. 
<laughs> um, it basically just makes sure it kind of works. Okay. Now, it might be useful as documentation. What does that mean? That means, say I wrote a dozen of these scenarios for whatever reason, and they're trying different amounts and whatever else. If I keep all 12 of those, that's not particularly useful documentation. One or two of those tells you what's going on. The other 10 were maybe little guideposts for me to figure out what's, but they're not adding any value. The incremental value of, of each of those, the marginal value of each of those additional 10 scenarios is like nil, yeah? So they might be useful as documentation, but we religiously hang on to them. We can honestly, we can get rid of most of them, okay? Um, they may form the basis of tests. I'm being very specific with my language. But yeah, you can run them and they execute and, they, and they, they, they pass or they fail. So technically they are doing some kind of validation for you, but actually there's probably a better test that you could run in that situation that would give you more information. So why not run, run, write that instead and run that? Yeah, because it seems silly to have this single, single point solution where you can have a much more general thing. <coughs> Check, um, I'll just <laughs> briefly mention because I, I can't not. So there's this whole thing about testing versus checking. And the idea is that there's some fairly angry testers who think that programmers have stolen the word test and totally appropriated it. And they're saying, well, they're not testing, they're just checking. And checking means doing an automated thing to get feedback. And testing is something that humans do that requires insight and knowledge and ha ha. And you actually have to make that noise. Okay? And, and I'm a bit confused by that because that's not what the words check and test mean. And I'm a native English speaker. So a test is anything, a test is anything that gives me feedback. Okay? A test is anything that increases confidence for a stakeholder through evidence. That's what a test is. Uh, um, checking is a typically binary activity in which I get a true or a false. So it's literally it's a check mark. There's a check mark in a check box. Okay, so the, the clue's in the name, right? And I have a check box, and in the check box I put a check mark if it's true. So I take my car in for its MOT test, for its roadworthiness test. That's a whole set of checks that they're going to carry out. They're going to carry out checks for emissions and electrics and, and, and tires and all kinds of things. If I went in and said, um, okay, so I'd like you to test my car, and they said, okay, well, your, your, uh, your headlamp is, isn't working, so you have to take the car away. Like, okay, I'll take the car away. Bring the car back with a working headlamp. Uh, yeah, so your emissions are high. Couldn't you have told me that before? Uh, you have to go, that's silly, right? So what I have is a test made up of a whole bunch of different checks. Okay, that's what checking and testing is. Any of those checks could be carried out by a human or a machine, um, depending. So I flew out of Billund Airport a few years ago in the deep winter, and it was a tiny little airplane, and everyone was a bit nervous. And there was a guy in a big, heavy coat walking around the airplane with a clipboard. I've got no idea what he was doing, but he was going like this. And I, I'm, I've no idea. I'm really, really glad he did it. <laughs> I felt a lot safer. Right? He was checking the plane using check marks on a checklist. Right? Again, all the clues are there. Um, I don't want a room bar doing that. Right? I want a human being doing that. Okay? Otherwise, I'm not getting in that plane. <clears throat> so then, scenarios is the basis of tests. So what general case is this an example of? Right? Um, <clears throat> so I've got this one case where I've got some money out, but I could, well, I could generalize that to loads of different cases. Um, how can I gain confidence in the general case? Now I'm having design conversations about a test that's going to be much more generally useful. Who's, whose need am I meeting here? What stakeholder am I serving? Yeah. Uh, um, and then we go down the stakeholder rabbit hole and we say, so whose needs haven't we met? And again, the jobs to be done, or what's called jobs theory, has this lovely framework in which we can start talking about um, primary needs, incidental needs, financial needs, social needs, um, all of those kind of, like, the, all of the things that are involved in me having my needs map. And this is a great way to think about designing our, our scenarios, right, and, uh, into tests. So I think of scenarios as necessary but not sufficient, okay? So let's look at what makes a good automated test then. So here's some of the things that I think make a good automated test. The first thing it needs is intention revealing name. Right? I need to know what it is that we are validating here. What behavior will I be more confident about when this test runs, or rather when this test passes? 
When it fails, I want to know how it failed. I want to know why it failed. Ideally, I want to know what I should do about it. Uh, Z shell, it's a wonderful, wonderful shell. With Z shell, if you mistype a command, it says, you know, not found. And then it says, did you mean? Because <laughs> it'll guess. Right? That's a really good error message, because the answer is usually, yeah, I did. I'm an idiot, I can't type. Right? Uh, um, a, a good automated test has consistent language. Okay? It has a, a domain specific. It's, it's, it's using the language of the domain. A good test has what I call the intent, the whole intent, and nothing but the intent. So help me God, right? So it tests one thing, yeah? Uh, it tests all of that thing. I don't need to look in a bunch of other different places to find the, re the remains of that testing. And I don't want it to have any extraneous guff. If I'm testing a calculation, I don't want to have to spin up a web server and a browser and go in and punch in a bunch of values and then navigate through a login screen just so I can test the calculation. Right? Go in and test the calculation. So I want it to be close to the action. Okay? So that's what, a, that's what a good automated test looks like. That's some of the characteristics. So I look at my, 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 my Gherkin scenario, my automated BDD scenario. What does that look like? Well, it's not bloody fast. Right? <laughs> Compared to a, a test that's written as a test, something that's going through four levels of indirection before it even hits an application cannot be faster. Um, not particularly intention revealing errors, you get massive stack traces full of like cryptic messages. Consistent language, well, yes, but there's loads of different domain languages going on now, including the given when then stuff and a bunch of other things. Um, the intent, the whole intent, often not, right? Often that's a really gray area. You've got lots and lots and lots of scenarios all doing really similar things, and you're kind of trying to play kind of where's Wally in there, and like, oh, that one's different because it's got a slightly different stripy shirt. I get it, okay? Good scenarios are not. <coughs> good tests, necessarily. So BDD isn't about testing. However, however, testing is complementary to BDD. Okay? Uh, I think it's a really good complement to BDD. It works alongside of it really well. BDD is a great thinking framework to highlight the things, to, well, to, firstly to highlight the stakeholders, and then to highlight ways in which we can give them confidence. I think of testing as the sufficient to BDD is necessary. You don't have to do BDD, but you have to do something like what BDD does. You have to think about what it is you're building, think about who you're building it for, figure out a way to determine whether you've built, it, built the right thing, figure out whether you actually met the need, and so on. Right? So testing works really well as a piece to that. Test thinking is critical to successful delivery, just as product thinking is critical to successful uh, meeting of needs, to successful product um, development. Okay. And testability isn't a, a bunch of things that happen at the end. Testability is a characteristic. It starts with design. It's a set of characteristics of your system. So microservices, um, they're small. They do one thing. They're very easy to test and in isolation. Systems made up of microservices are really, really, really complicated and have loads of emergent characteristics and stuff. And so we need to think about testing them in a very different way. And we often don't. So there's a big gap, I think, in the thinking space around being confident about complex microservice applications. So BDD then, I've been saying it like this for some time, BDD is this. BDD is writing software that matters for people whose lives you touch. Okay? And so testing is a critical part of that, because otherwise we cannot know that we've given those people whose lives we touch sufficient confidence that they can sleep at night. And that's kind of our job. So thank you very much.